evening. Welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and answering your questions tonight, the Director of the Centre for Public Christianity, John Dixon, theoretical physicist and cosmologist Lawrence Krauss of the Origins Project, Health Minister Tanya Plibersek, the Shadow Minister for Climate Action, Greg Hunt, and doctor and commentator and author Cindy Pan. Please welcome our panel. Q&A is live from 935 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. It is simulcast on News24 and News Radio. Go to our website, send a question or the Twitter conversation using the hashtag on your screen. Our first question tonight comes from Jenny Stoddard. Professor Krauss, uh, science claims more than method. In fact, it claims to offer us a future, future hope. But in and of itself, science has no ethical boundaries. Uh, what are the values, if God and faith are to be exclu excluded, that will actually measure the impact of science on human life? Well, I, don't, I think it's wrong to say that science has no ethical boundary. Science mm -hmm. is based on telling the truth, which is a really important ethical boundary. Mm -hmm. It's one that I, I don't think religion shares, in fact. Uh, the point is that, that telling the truth and full disclosure and also Doubting yourself, being skeptical of, of, of your, because the easiest person to fool is yourself. And I think all those values are, in fact, the very values we need for a better society. All those things, if any of those things were true in, in my country, in Washington, it would be a better place. And so I think that science can offer a better world, and in fact, a world that's more ethical, and to the extent that you talk about morality, than, than, than you can get from, from, um, uh, books written iron, based on iron, iron Age peasants who, who didn't even know the Earth orbited the Sun. I really think that, in fact, if you look at, at democracies and science, science has not flourished in countries that don't have democracies, and democracy can't function without the very things that science is based on, an informed public, an informed legislature, basically, who base public policy on empirical facts instead of ideology. And that's very important in my Lawrence, mind. so just briefly take the other side of the equation, and that is the impact that religious ethics have upon science. It has none. <laughs> I, 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 none whatsoever. In fact, the, you know, religion never enters into science. Uh, but, there, well, for example, the Catholic Church has strong positions on reproductive technology, for example, so it does enter into the science market in that regard. Well, whenever they do, they get it wrong. Uh, absolutely. I mean, when the Pope says that say condoms contribute to AIDS in Africa, that's not science, that's ideology, and it's nonsense, because of course, we know that empirical evidence tells us that in fact, women who, whose husbands have AIDS, should be, they should be using condoms. It's not, it's not an ideological question, it's a scientific one, and we wanna save lives. And so I think that whenever you see the church or religion trying to intrude upon science, they almost always get it wrong. Let's go to uh, John Dixon. Should uh, the church, the values of faith and God, uh, as a questioner asked, should they be involved in science in any way? I agree with almost everything Lawrence just said, actually, uh, except I, I would beg to differ about whether science can actually produce an ethic. I think uh, human beings produce an ethic and we decide whether to use science uh, positively or negatively according to our worldview. And history is littered with examples of science being used brilliantly, uh, ethically so, uh, and times when it's used badly. I disagree that science has any ethical import. It's a, it's a neutral discipline and it's a wonderful discipline. The little quips that I heard throughout uh, about uh, science is all about humility and so on, I love. Uh, in fact, Peter Harrison of Oxford University, who's one of the world's leading historians of science, thinks that it was a revolution in this doctrine of humility that uh, flourished in the 14th and 15th centuries that got science going in Europe, in part. It's not a total uh, explanation, but that as Augustine philosophy developed, which basically said human beings are flawed, so we need better techniques. We can't trust our brains. We need to observe. And this Augustinian philosophy grew out of Christianity, as you know. And so Christianity probably is in part responsible for science in the first place. 
I agree that it shouldn't stick its head in now and tell the scientists what to do. My view is, let the scientists do the science. Well, and, I, uh, and, and let uh, religious believers do what they do. Well, I agree with you. I think historically, if you look at it, because the church was the only game in town in the 15th century, they, science arose out of, out of religion, and it's great, and, and it served a good purpose, and now we should just put it aside. And except in science. China, of course. <laughs> we're, uh, I was going to say, except in China, of course, where uh, science flourished without uh, this kind of religion at all. But let's, let's just move on quickly. I want to hear from the rest of our panelists. We've got quite a lot to get through. Tanya Plibersek, your thoughts. Um, I think that everybody should ask themselves, what is a life well lived? What do we owe to other people, not just what is owed to us? And um, some people are motivated to do that because they have religious beliefs and their values system um, says that God asks that of you. Uh, other people ask that question of themselves, not because God has asked it of them, but because they have thought themselves, how do I live my life well? What do I owe to others? And I've known some very moral atheists and I've known some pretty nasty Christians. I don't think that uh, living a life well depends on an, an external um, uh, system imposed upon a person. But I do think you need to question and I do think you need to um, examine your own values and motivations, behaviours and beliefs uh, often. Greg Hunt. Do scientific values have a place in science at all? Well, look, you have a, a religious role. Religious values, I should say. You have a role for faith, a role for science, which are equally about trying to give people a sense of hope and of uh, aspiration of improving the world in which we live. And both can play a critically important part. Historically, they have. Each has been used for good. Each has been misused for for bad on different occasions. Uh, that's about the hands in which it's exercised. But I had an experience just today where they both came together. I was in a little country church. It was for the funeral of a, a friend of mine. He was a, an 81-year-old dairy farmer, uh, John Coleman, same name as the footballer. He lived a magnificent life. He was ultimately an incredibly rational person. He was a, a, an accountant and a banker. He became a dairy farmer. He used science in in helping to advance uh, feeding people, as he called it, giving people milk products. He was also a man of great faith. And there was an incredible beauty as 300 people crowded into a small country church and there was a great sense that he had lived a, a, a life, to use Tanya's terms, which was the life well lived. And it was based on the duality. And that was magnificent for me, this sense of a life of purpose and practice and living in the world of, of science and farming and food and a life of culture, of community and of faith. And that, to me, is what we should be about. Cindy Pan. Well, certainly I think ethics, not necessarily religious ethics, but ethics generally has a central and vital role in uh, science, certainly from a health perspective. And I was always taught by um, a professor that... Um, that in fact ethics was the starting point for any study. If it didn't pass the ethics committee, they didn't look any further because if the ethics is bad, the science is bad and that was basically the dictum. If the ethics is bad, you don't need to read any further because the science is by definition then bad. Um, and certainly in terms of religion and science, um, I mean Lawrence was referring to the issue of, you know, uh, Catholicism and condoms and HIV transmission. Um, I was reading, you know, in the context of, you know, all the cardinals sort of jockeying for the, the new position. Um, and apparently this African cardinal is considered very progressive because he has said that, um, that in uh, these sort of couples where one partner is HIV positive, that condoms might have a role. So, um, I mean, obviously that is definitely so, but I find it interesting that that's considered progressive because I think most people would consider that obvious. And then in terms of... Um, but that's progressive for the Catholic yeah, Church. Yeah, and then in terms of um, the Catholic position on abortion and even some non-Catholics position on abortion, I mean, there was a recently highly publicised case of that woman in Ireland who died in a major public teaching hospital uh, because... Um, a, a DNC wasn't carried out, mm -hmm. and uh, there, there was there was certainly no um, good medical reason not to. But I, I think it was more of a sort of a religious thing, and I, I'm sure many of the doctors there um, felt very um, tortured by that 
uh, having to let a, a perfectly healthy woman die. And uh, personally, I think that there's nothing ethical about um, allow allowing someone to die in those circumstances on religious basis. So I think their religion and ethics actually become an oxymoron. Not always, but in certain instances, definitely. All right, it's good underpinning for the discussion <laughs> we're about to have. You're uh, watching Q&A. Remember, you can send your web or video questions to our website. The address is on the screen. Our next question is a video. It comes from uh, Kerry Harrison in Harrison Town, in Harris Town, I should say, Queensland. I expected my kids to be taught science in science classes at their local state school. So I was a bit angry when my son was taught a creation story about the origin of the universe in his year 11 physics class at a local high school. My son didn't want me to do anything because he was concerned about possible repercussions for his grades, which in Queensland count toward university entrance. So I want to know from the panel what your attitude is towards the teaching of religion in science classes and to Tanya and Greg in particular, what you and your parties will do to stop religion being taught in our science classes. Tanya Plibersek, let's start with you. Well, I just think that's an extraordinary story. I, I'm quite happy for kids at school to, to participate in religious education if their parents want them to, but science is science, and I don't think um, there are many scientists who uh, would accept the literal interpretation of the Bible, um, the creation of the earth. Uh, it, it shouldn't. It shouldn't happen. We've got a national curriculum so, being developed. Uh, I, was I don't say, think yeah, creationism yeah. is going to be in the science curriculum of the national curriculum. So will, be will the federal government indeed. be in a position to impose a national curriculum on states like Queensland if they choose to continue not to do that? Well, uh, look, I'm not sure how widespread this is. Well, that's a state and school. Yes, but it's one state school. Mm -hmm. You might have run into one teacher with particularly. Um, particular views in one school. Um, I don't know that we can say that that is a characterisation of what's being taught in science in all of our state schools. I'd be very surprised and, and very disturbed. Mm. Well, people, well, 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 and, and, uh, people around yeah. me, once I've come to Australia and given me a lot of examples in Queensland, the fact of creationism being used well, in, in science. Well, take, well, take okay. what we'll do. We'll go, we actually have another video question which I think demonstrates that this is a little more widespread. It's from Cathy Byrne in East Ballina, New South Wales. Let's go to that one as well. My question is for Lawrence Krauss. You may know that some evangelical religious groups have direct access to children in Australian public schools. My research has shown that some of these organisations teach that man and dinosaurs once lived together, that the earth is only 6,000 years old, and that children will burn in hell if they don't read the Bible every day. How might teaching such things to children in state education affect Australia's future? All right, Lawrence Gales, that was directed to you. So we'll go to you first and then we'll hear from the rest of the panel. Okay, well, um, I've uh, recently in the United States uh, just uh, uh, stated that uh, cr teaching creationism is child abuse, and I, I think it is. Uh, namely, if you withhold knowledge or you do anything to children that puts them at a competitive disadvantage, uh, as adults, it's child abuse. It's mild forms of child abuse, but it's, 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 it's like withholding med medicine, withholding knowledge uh, that later on will cause kids to become less competitive because evolution is the basis of modern biology. And, and teaching things that are basically lies, even if they're well-intentioned, is child abuse. I mean, people, it's not that people are doing this to be evil, but they're they're hurting their children, especially, of course, telling kids they're going to go to hell. That's definitely child abuse. It is inappropriate, and teachers not only should not be doing this, but in fact, if they are, they should be removed, in my opinion, because the purpose of education, as I've often said, is not to validate ignorance, but to overcome it. John Dixon. <laughs> yeah. This is going to be an agree fest, I think. Great. Uh, I agree. Uh, but for one thing that, that I think uh, lowers, <laughs> lowers the tone. Uh, uh, on the science, I totally agree. And you'll find that most uh, mainstream Christians are very comfortable with science yeah. and with all of the discoveries of science, including the 13.72 uh, billion years ago there was a bang. Right. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, evolution by natural selection, Th this is standard. Uh, when you go to theological college, you are taught how to read Genesis 1. 
and it's quite clear that Genesis 1 is written in a style that is most unlike the historical prose we know from mm. other parts of the Bible. The style is not quite poetry, but it's more in the direction of poetry. It uses number symbolism in a way that would blow your mind. The artistry of it is clear. Now, uh, this is not Christians in the modern world scared of evolution or the findings of science and so changing what they think of the Bible. This was the view of ancient Jews like Philo of Alexandria in the first century, uh, the, the greatest theologian of the ancient world, uh, St. Augustine, uh, Origen, Clement, and so on. This was a pre-scientific analysis of the text. So I think uh, whatever science discovers and can truly uh, demonstrate I sign up for. So, Absolutely. John, I've, I've got to address you. What, what do you think is going on in these schools then? I mean, is it some um, radical branch of the Christian church no, that somehow look, got into these schools? There I mean, are, there what, are a lot what do of, you think is actually happening? I think there, it isn't happening a lot, uh, but it's, it's up to the officials to go and find out how much it's happening. And I've got plenty of friends who are six-day creationists, and I'm, I'm going to get some love mail after this for sure. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, I have great relationships with them. I just think they're wrong. Wrong on the science, wrong on the Bible. The, it's, only, it's thing I wanna, the only thing I want to pick up points. Lawrence with is to say, to call it child abuse. To me, there are two problems with this. One, it so uh, inflames the conversation. And I think the new atheism breeds of this kind of inflamed kind of conversation. The second, the second thing I find, it, find very uncomfortable about it is that anyone in the audience who has actually been abused finds that a very odd use of that very loaded term. I know you don't mean it like that, but it's like someone saying, oh, that's a holocaust. There's one holocaust. Well, I think, you, I look, I realize it's loaded, and, and, uh, but I think you have to draw attention to the fact that we shouldn't, that we shouldn't support at all lying to children and, and, and in fact, uh, um, uh, Presenting them th with things which we know are wrong and and uh, leading totally them down the agree. path, but and look, that, they're going to get to university, and we all do that as parents too at some level. But but uh, but you know, then we we the purpose of uh, if you're a parent is to try and get kids to think for themselves, to question, and to say you shouldn't believe science because, and I think it's fear. The the reason this is happening is that there are a lot of people who are, think that science will remove their faith, and therefore it's better that their kids not know how the universe really works for fear that they might stop believing in God. But that's the same thing that drives the Taliban. Okay. And they what, don't want what kids you should to be, be doing, educated. Lawrence, what you should be doing, here's a little tactic. Yeah. Hand them over to us. <laughs> People like the Center for Public Christianity, where I work, who are trying to educate uh, not only the general public, but also the Christian public on biblical scholarship and scientific scholarship, to call it child abuse, uh, I just think is, is all wrong. When you say hand them over to us, do you mean the people uh, who are teaching yeah. these things should, <laughs> yeah. should actually be handed over to you for re-education? Yeah, is well, that look, what you yeah, say? Yeah. We, we have this little prison out the back. No, <laughs> look. OK, hang on, go I just, I just mean, I just mean, <laughs> we, we could be the friend. We could be the friend to the new atheism and have the effect you want I think all you're doing is uh, firming up the opposition. And OK, well, I'm, sorry, I'm just going to hear from the rest of the panellists. And Greg Hunt. The original question was addressed to both you and to uh, Tanya Plibersek, and the question was, what will you do to stop uh, religion being taught in science classes? Well, the first thing is a very simple principle. Science for the science classes, uh, religion for the religious instruction classes, and the battle between the two for the history classes, the Renaissance, the Reformation, uh, because that is part of our great history and they do come together sure. there. So the simple answer is the national curriculum will keep science for the science class. Of that I have absolutely no doubt. By the way, out. climate change for science classes? Of course. Yeah, OK, fine. Sydney Pan. <laughs> that, that, was a, that, that was a sort of a passingly cheap shot, Tony. <laughs> it was a, just a brief question. I a Cindy. brief answer. Sydney Pan. <laughs> What I was thinking when the two of you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, what children are being taught. And maybe 
um, you know, if a child happens to, one year in their schooling, be taught by a teacher who uh, believes in creationist theory, um, I mean, fortunately, I think there are a multiplicity of truths that will be pre presented to children. And one of the most important that thing that um, children and adults have to learn is that they will be presented with uh, a multiplicity of truths and sometimes they have to eventually use their own judgment to discern what is true and what is false. For example, there are many people who believe that the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus are real. Some people think they're not real and some people are not sure. Um, we're all taught uh, at a certain point that they're real, but at a certain age we all come to understand that maybe they're not. And there's a, there's a period where, you know, they'll be saying, oh, so-and-so at school says they're not real, but I'm not sure. And I must say, I've been through this with my kids. And I said, basically, I drew the corollary with Jesus and God. And I said, well, with God, there are people who believe he's real. There are people who believe he's not real. And there are people there that are not sure. And I said, um, with Santa Claus... Um, I'm not sure. What about you? And, <laughs> and my son said, well, I think Santa's real, but I think God is not. <laughs> well, and I think, you know, it's the same with the, philosophy going well, with the creationist thing. I mean, they're going to hear that story. And it's a story, and all stories have value. And sometimes it's not simply a question of is the story true or is it false. A story has value regardless of whether it's true or false. For example, we all enjoy Little Red Riding Hood, The Three Bears. There are all these stories that are eternal, that have um, mythical uh, status, but they have value because there's often a moral or they're entertaining or for whatever... Va Cindy, I hope reason. you're not making the comparison with the God thing here because yeah. Yeah. how many adults do you know come to believe in Santa? Yeah. Right? Well, uh, you know... Well, I'm just saying that... Um, adults come to believe it, in God. There the people, analogy doesn't work for me. Whatever age who believe, well, there are people who presence. don't believe and there are people <laughs> who are not sure. You believe... You don't believe, and I'm sure there are many people who are not sure. But this isn't a question about God. This is a question, you know, when you say all stories have value, that's fine, but the story but, that the earth is 6,000 years old doesn't have any value because it's that wrong. Children, that's a good, actually, so good. So, uh, just, I'm going to interrupt you both because we actually that have every, a. Not sorry. all teachers. Cindy, so tell I'm just going to interrupt you because. Uh, the same, yeah. you know. there, there is a questioner here, actually, uh, I think does believe in creationism, and it's Tim Hubbard. Hubble. Um, Dr. or oh, Professor Krauss, it seems to me that everything science examines shows us more beauty and complexity to the universe we live in. When you think about it philosophically, this amazing complexity points towards an intelligent first cause. Well, I mean, that's how it works with humans, you know. Um, only intelligent minds can create complex things. Isn't it bad parenting to force your children to learn that people evolved uh, from the ancestors of monkeys without letting them have the opportunity to think about it logically and come to their own conclusion. Well, look, I don't think you should force kids to do anything, but what you should try and do is explain to them how the world works and give them evidence and, in fact, ask them to try and understand the world through evidence, okay? Now, the point is, the evidence tells us, it's not a matter of opinion, the evidence tells us that evolution happened. Okay? And in fact, it's the basis of modern biology. It's the basis of modern drug development. And, to, to, and I agree with you that science tells us, I mean, it just makes the world fascinating and far more interesting than, than, than myth. And in fact, I get upset when people say that science isn't spiritual. I get spiritual wonder looking at every Hubble Space Telescope picture. But, and, and, and science, in fact, is better kind of spirituality because it's real. <laughs> And I think that's the important thing. So you're absolutely right. I don't think so parents should force kids to do anything. But what they should try and do is encourage kids to learn and provide them the best available knowledge base. And, and, and it is unfortunate that some people, for some reason, as, as you seem to do, fear the notion of the fact of the reality that humans and, and, and uh, hum that uh, all species descended from a common ancestor. It's just unequivocal. The, the, it's the best tested theory in science. And it's not, we don't hold to it because we have some, some you know, secret handshake. If we're wrong, it'd be great because the way to make, become famous in science is to prove your colleagues wrong. <laughs> and so, uh, I'm, I'm going to go back. Yeah, uh, anyway. You mentioned the Hubble <laughs> telescope. Our questioner is Tim Hubble. Uh, no, no relation, I suspect. But in any, in any event, I mean, do you, listening to what you're saying, do you, do you believe that evolution and religious um, theories about the origins of human beings should be taught alongside each other in science? 
um, I, I think, yeah, they can be taught alongside each other, I guess. The, the question is really the first cause. Um, and uh, that's a philosophical question. Science but, can't explain uh, the first cause. That's got nothing to do with biology. First so. cause is a complex philosophical question, and, and I, I deal with it in some sense as a scientist, as a cosmologist who worries about how the universe began. But that's very different than the facts of biology. And so the question that's of concern to you is very different than teaching kids how biology works. And it's a disservice to them not to teach them how. Okay, Tony, Tony uh, yep. there's just one of the things, I guess, that has concerned me in the last few years, there's been a real debate uh, about, th that essentially discredits science by saying that scientists are self-interested, the reason that people are researching climate change is that there's something in it for them. And the, the practical impact of that really worries me because it allows people to ignore the vast body of scientific evidence in an area like climate change and cling to, well, you know, it's, I don't feel hotter today than I did yesterday, so it's obviously made up. And the, the example in Queensland that really worried me recently was um, the Queensland government giving permission to local councils to stop putting fluoride in water. Now, the biggest health uh, intervention in dental care in Australia for decades is putting fluoride in water. Any dentist you talk to will tell you they can tell who grew up in Queensland where they've had less fluoride in the water. They've got a mouthful of fillings compared with people who've grow, well, grown up with fluoride. Then, yeah. And, and it, it drives me nuts that we've got Queen, people in the Queensland Parliament saying one guy who's a bodybuilder in the Queensland Parliament said he would rather take banned substances for a year than drink a glass of water with fluoride in it. Yeah. It's so, nuts. Is he, 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 he well, especially well-muscled? He, he, he is actually rather well muscled. <laughs> oh, he's his teeth, teeth, however. <laughs> he's also. <laughs> I think he's well muscled in his head, I think. Is really. CD Pan. I just want to say, um, in, with your comment, the irony is that people who spend all this money buying bottled water because they're scared yeah. of tap water, they're the ones who've got their dental problems because that doesn't yeah. have the fluoride. Yep. Um, you know, this idea that tap water has problems, it's actually the best. It's yep. the best thing best to drink. drink. Uh, yeah. Best drink to give your kids. Yeah. <laughs> and it's pretty much free. The uh, next question comes from Aaron Kingsley. Uh, my question is to Professor Krauss. Wow. The last time that your good friend Richard Dawkins was on Q&A, he was asked rather mockingly how we can possibly get something from nothing. Being a biologist and not a physicist, Richard respectfully declined to give a comprehensive answer. He mentioned that people often found it hard to deal with the fact that there was nothing before the Big Bang. Yet when you ask the same people what came before God, they often say nothing or that he had always existed. Now that we have you here, could you please give us a more detailed explanation as to how the universe can in fact arise from nothing? <laughs> okay, in a minute. Um, uh, what is amazing, it is an amazing fact, and, and I watched Richard when he was here, actually trying to explain evolution to Cardinal Pell who couldn't understand it. But uh, um, the, the, the amazing thing is that one of the things we've learned from science is that our common sense does not necessarily apply to the universe. Uh, we, we evolved to avoid tigers on the plains of Africa, but not to understand quantum mechanics. And so the way the re universe really works is very often, as I say, defines common sense. And what is truly remarkable, and the reason I've been talking about it, writing about it lately, is that we understand that, in fact, empty space, which for many people is a good first example of nothing, is actually unstable. Quantum mechanics will allow particles to suddenly pop out of nothing, and it doesn't violate any laws of physics. Just the known laws of quantum mechanics and relativity can produce 400 billion galaxies, each containing 100 billion stars. And then beyond that, it turns out when you apply quantum mechanics to gravity, space itself can arise from nothing, as can time. It seems impossible, but it's completely possible. And what is amazing to me is if you asked what would be the characteristics of a universe that came from nothing by laws of physics, it would be precisely the characteristics of the universe we measure. And in fact, one of your Australians measured a key part of it and won a Nobel Prize. He's been on this program. My friend Brian Schmidt. And it, that was completely unexpected. It is amazing that our universe looks exactly like a universe that could have come from nothing. Does that prove it? No. But it makes it plausible. And that is amazing. Just like, in fact, before Darwin, evolution was a miracle. Or life was a miracle. Every, every, every life form was specially created. Darwin didn't know about DNA and genetics, but what he showed that looking at the evidence, it was plausible 
that, that all of the diversity of life could come from a simple beginning. And I find those things worth celebrating, independent of whether they relate to God or not. The universe is unbelievably amazing. Just before we, uh, we've got another, we've got a question on that. I'll just quickly bring in uh, Harold Jansen before I bring in the other panelists. Yeah, so uh, if you're claiming that the universe came from nothing and nothing isn't really nothing, where did the nothing come from? No, well, look, look, you know, the, the interesting thing is I science. Add, where did the laws of physics come from? I didn't say it's not from? nothing. I actually think the point is science changes what we mean by words. So I've, you know, I've discussed with philosophers and they say, you know what? We don't like your definition of nothing because it's not what Aristotle described. Well, the point is so science changes the meaning of things. It's called learning. And, and, the, and, and, and you might have said that nothing was an infinite empty void like the Bible would have said. Well, that would be empty space. Okay, we've learned that that kind of nothing is much more complicated than you thought. There's nothing in it. There's no real particles, but it actually has properties. But then I, the point is that we, you can go much further and say there's no space, no time, no universe, and not even any fundamental laws. Yeah. And it could all spontaneously arise. And it seems to me, if you have no laws, no space, no time, no particles, no radiation, it's a pretty good approximation to nothing. But uh, uh, Harold actually asked the question, uh, I think you were saying, did the laws of physics equally spring from nothing, fully formed well, into, it, into existence what from is nothing? It, what, it, what is surprising is that, it, that the conventional wisdom at right now, which could be wrong, and that's the other nice thing about science, we, we don't mind being wrong and changing our minds, unlike religion, but uh, <laughs> um, is, that, is that in fact, the, because of discovering that empty space has energy, it seems quite plausible that our universe may be one part, one, just one universe in what could be a, almost an infinite number of universes. And in every universe, the laws of physics are different. And they come into existence when the universe comes into existence. So our laws of physics, physics may become, God forbid, forgive me for saying could, that, could, could but some, God, could, just environmental science. Could our, some of those universes have gods creating them? Uh, <laughs> no, because, <laughs> the, the, no, the, because it, it's, it, the point is that you know, when people say that you need, a, you need a God to create a universe, you need an intelligence to create a universe, they, they, uh, then the key question, of course, is, well, if God is more complex than the universe, then how could God come into existence? Mm. And okay. so the thing I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you I, I, I threw that but to First of all, ha Harold is, uh, well, Harold is I mean, trying to be brave God. enough to re-enter this debate. Yeah, I mean, forget the whole thing about God. What I'm, what I'm hearing for you is that, hey, these people like Aristotle, uh, are addressing nothing and it's no properties, an empty set. But now, in order for us to an answer it, let's change the meaning of the term. So in order to get an answer, let's just change the question no, altogether. No, 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 no. Well, well, it's true that in science we try and answer questions that are answerable, which is really an important thing, I think. But the, I would argue that nothing is a physical quantity. It's the absence of something. Okay? So to understand what nothing is, you have to think carefully about what something is. And that's what science tells us. So we're trying to, uh, we're trying to take an, an empirical approach to try and understand what the absence of something is. And I think you're, there are deep philosophical issues that we're not going to resolve in this program, but I do think... But they are the problem with what you're saying. Okay. This, well, this well, where well, I want yeah, to yeah, No, 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 I think we've better let John jump <laughs> in here. Physicists... Or he'll explode. <laughs> <laughs> the big bang. There'll be a big bang, that's right. <laughs> Physicists have every right to go and uh, discover things and uh, to, An propose, obligation, in fact. to propose theories. And uh, Lawrence has a theory that's uh, been out a while that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure you will, that basically there's a vacuum, <laughs> no you've got virtual and antiparticles that pop in and out of existence. Uh, they have energy values, but the average ener energy is zero. They're operating according to the quantum uh, laws that's nothing. And I just want to say, this is part of the problem with new atheism. It's the... It's science, not atheism. It's, it's the overreach. Here is a physicist telling us about something that all of us think sounds like something and saying by some magical change of the English language, no, it's nothing. And if you disagree with me, then you don't understand science. But there no, are that's... scientists, leading scientists, who agree this ain't nothing. It's a very complex and beautiful something. And I think Tim's point earlier is the key point. Uh, we live in a universe that operates according to these elegant, beautiful laws. And when I read your book this week, I was more convinced that that's the case. And this universe uh, operating according to these elegant laws has produced minds 
that now understand the laws, especially this mine awesome. next to us. Yeah. And uh, so this to me all looks, and this is not a proof for God, mm. but I'm just saying why a lot of people think the God thing's got a lot going for it. The whole thing looks rational. The whole thing looks set up to be known. Now only known in a rational, uh, like the God of Einstein. So then you've got to ask yourself the question, is there any evidence on the world stage that this God we think is maybe just a mind has touched the earth in a tangible way. And for me, if you're asking me why do I think there's a God, it's this uh, philosophy of science plus the life of Jesus. Well, yeah, but which, hold on. You, there was a bait and switch there that I, that I object to, and that was that... Can I get that, to the end of the bait? Well, you said Jesus, and then you started going <laughs> off. And, and so, no longer, okay. so what I'm saying is, you ask yourself the question, is there any tangible thing in the history of the world that looks like contact from the God we suspect might be there. The, the overwhelming, I think, overwhelming evidence points in the direction of Jesus, his life, his teaching, and his healings, his death and resurrection. And when I come to believe that, uh, this opens up the world to me. It's like C.S. Lewis saying, uh, I believe in Christianity for the same reason I believe in the sun, not because I can look at it, but because by it I see everything. And for me, Christianity explains the world I live in in such a spooky and deep way that I find I, I feel I have met the God I had a hunch was there based mm -hmm. only on the beautiful well, it, okay. elegance. Uh, all right, so, yeah. so now we've moved into the... Yeah. Now, we, I was going to say, I, I'd like Lawrence to respond to that. We've moved into the area of intuition now. Um, and perhaps and perhaps we have also with your idea of nothing. And this is the problem, isn't it? We have two competing theories no, as no, to how the world came into existence. Well, I think the point is, it's, I really object when it's two competing theories. One, a scientific theory is falsifiable. It's testable. God isn't testable. I can't disprove the existence of God. I can't disprove the possibility that we all were created three seconds ago with the, with the memories of, of this delightful conversation we've had. So the, the point is well, that we, we can putting play science... We can tape later. <laughs> putting, put, putting, putting science and religion as if they're competing theories does a disservice to science because science... You know, you can That's say... That's not that, what you're hearing from no, me, though, is Well, it? no, it is because you're saying that exp explains the world to you. It doesn't... Exp Christianity doesn't explain how airplanes fly no. or how... And, and, and the, the bait and switch that, that worried me is when you say... All of this provides clear evidence that there's intelligence or design. The point is, the universe behaves, that. but the universe, if you look at it, it behaves as if there's no purpose to the universe. Now, does that prove there's no purpose? Absolutely not. But a universe that behaves without purpose, and a universe created by God to look like a universe without purpose, well, they might as well be the same to me. It makes God irrelevant, and God is irrelevant. When I okay, I, no, I don't want to make the rest of our panel irrelevant. I want to hear <laughs> yeah, okay. how they're responding to your arguments, and I'll start with Tanya Plibersek. Well, the, the only thing that I'd like to hear a bit more of is um, the science of Star Trek. Yeah, like so Star if Trek. we could move the conversation a little bit more to the science of Star Trek, that would be excellent. Um, I'm happy about that. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, really, uh, I'm really enjoying the discussion, Tony. I, I think um, the 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 opposition of um, atheism, and uh, atheism and science on one side and, um, and re religion on the other side, I don't think is a fair opposition, though. And I, I think um, when, you, when you keep talking to Lawrence about the new atheism, he, that's not the point he's making at all. He's not trying to disprove the um, existence of God. He's just saying that there's a, a whole lot of science that explains a lot to us and that we're learning more about it all the time. And... Um, there's a whole lot of things that we can't explain with science yet, but we may well one day. And there's a great example of that at the moment. Uh, in the last few years, um, there's a whole lot of um, genetic material, um, junk DNA, um, that uh, people thought was irrelevant to the way that the human body worked. And all of the time, we're now finding in that junk DNA, the little bits in between um, the, the bits that 
doctors and scientists have always been interested in finding that the junk DNA um, affects the way that the body behaves or responds to drugs or better treatments can be developed. And I think that that's a really good analogy for our understanding of the world as well. I, I hope and expect that my children and grandchildren will understand the universe a whole lot better. And one thing, though, Lawrence, I did um, um, want to um, disagree with you on, you, you talked about we've evolved to kind of escape from tigers, but I think that it is a marvellous thing about the human mind that we have this quest for understanding of how the universe started and, and how our bodies work and, you know, all of the things that are unclear to us now, it's a, um, it is a beautiful and unique thing about the human mind that we are impelled to ask those questions and to seek answers for them. Yeah, I, I, I just note, note that you want to hear about the science of Star Trek. I'm yes, just please. imagining you sitting in Parliament thinking, beam me up, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. We, we are, in fact, good. debating the Big Bang in the next parliamentary sitting, so... <laughs> Uh, it is quite an amazing... Uh, you serious about that? Uh, of course, <laughs> as you just watch. Uh, it, it's quite an amazing thing to be in a place where the decisions are made and you look at all of the different elements of our society. That's one of the things in our, in our profession, that we get to sort of live not just in one sliver but right across the whole society, whether you're a local member or whether you're looking at... National Did we just go from the origins None of the way, universe to, to, to... That's a good... That was and, pretty good. That was pretty and the, the point about this is, you know, for years I have uh, sensed it's a real privilege so to be where we are. Tonight I asked Lawrence before we came on air, so what came before the Big Bang? And he looked at me and said, I don't think that's a very good question. I'm sure he's treated you in a much more respectful way, but... Uh, <laughs> it, we don't know the answers. We're not going to try to pretend. Lawrence is... An, extraordinary intellect. Uh, but I've asked Brian Schmidt the same question and he said, look, you could ask the Cardinal or you could ask the physicist or others that same question about what came before the Big Bang. And what it says to me is that we all have to find our own way as to how we best live in this world. The science from the Big Bang to now, I have zero question about that. That to me was settled years ago when I was 11 or 12 or 13. But how we live, that's the question which is interesting in terms of uh, faith and how people find their way through life and how they relate to each other. That's why the two are important and why they have to coexist together. Cindy Pan. I think there's fiction and there's non-fiction, but I think there's just as much truth and value and inspiration in fiction as there is in non-fiction. That's why it doesn't surprise me that you find the truths that you find in a story that I don't necessarily think is non-fiction, but I see the truth in it. I think, um, just to draw an example a lot of people will be familiar with, say the story The Life of Pi, um, most people are familiar with that story either because it was a Booker Prize winner or because of the movie. I mean, you go, when you read it, you go through it thinking, sort of suspending belief of, did this really happen? Then, of course, without wanting to spoil it, I mean, at the end, you realise the story had a kind of truth, but it was a completely different truth. Mm -hmm. And I think, and as the main character said, you know, you believe whichever story you like, but they're both true. They're true, one as an allegory or metaphor, but the truth is the same whichever way you want to look at it. And I think that um, in terms of the relevance of the truths and how powerful those truths are, obviously from a science and particularly from a medical perspective, the truth of evolution and, uh, you know, Darwinism, Mendelian theory, I mean, this is alive and well today. And, and I was thinking when you were talking about physicists and evolution, I mean, with physicists and scientists as, and doctors, it is survival of the fittest because basically if your theory can be destroyed by a fitter or more logical theory, then it will be. So it is the survival of the most logical or more, more scientific and rigorously thought through theories that um, prevail and allow then further theories to be built on those theories. I, I, could, I just want to jump in one more time because yeah. I want, I, I, you know, it sounded very good what you said, Greg. But, however. but well, however, in, I mean, it does sound good, but I, I think your determination of, of the good life you want to live to a great extent is based on science. In fact, it, you know, it, it's based on the fact that you, you shouldn't have slaves, that women actually are equals of men, that, that uh, uh, all the things that science has ultimately led us to have produced what I think most of what you would describe as a good life. I ask people, if you stop believing God, would you go out and murder your neighbor? 
I've actually had some people say yes, but, <laughs> but, but I think it's not God. It's not, it's not that faith. It's rationality. And science has brought a rational view that has led to, a, to much of what I think you, you would describe as the good life that you, that you promote. Presumably. Okay, I'm going to uh, move along uh, because we've got a couple of issues. Uh, I think they relate a little bit to what Cindy was talking about to move on to. You're watching Q&A. The next question comes from Milos Nikolic. Uh, down here. Uh, you're a popular man tonight, Professor Krauss. This is again for you. Um, discussions about climate change have become increasingly polarised and um, emotionally charged. Mm -hmm. On one extreme, uh, you've got people who deny that climate change is real. And on the other extreme, um, people deny that they're... They say that the science is done and that there is no debate and no uncertainty. Mm. Um, so as a physicist, would you agree that due to the extremely complex nature of climate systems, climate science uh, doesn't have the capacity for rigorous proof and... Uh, sorry, what was my question? <laughs> uh, uh, and predictive powers, as physics does. And if so, do you think this should influence the tone of the discussions well, around climate change? Well, climate science is complex. I do physics because it's easy. Um, <laughs> but but I, I disagree with you. I think, you know, the point is that, that um, climate scientists are scientists. They're trying to make predictions and test their models. And in fact, there's a tremendous amount of evidence that in fact our models are basically correct. But the thing that is often not realized about climate change is not a prediction of the future. It's happening. Mm. It's data. Mm. Sea levels are rising. But the, is, there is a lot of predictions that are made by climate scientists. And I'm not coming at, and, at this and, question and, and, from but, a but denial. But I, think, but I think the key point that you mentioned is the word uncertainty. The great thing about science is that there's uncertainty. Because in science, and probably it's the only area of human activity, where you can actually quantify your uncertainty. And the good climate scientists will build models and they'll, they'll quantify their uncertainty. And, uh, and, and, and that, is, that, that makes it more powerful and not less powerful. But, but do you think that people acknowledge that, though? Because I find that a lot in the public debate, there's people who just say there is no uncertainty. The, the, what science well, there's no uncertainty is, about is... the data. I mean, facts, you know, it's true that models are, depend upon, you know, some of them are right or some of them are wrong. But the facts are that the climate is changing. And the climate is changing at an incredibly accelerated rate that is completely consistent with human industrial activity. And, and it's terrifying. I just ran a climate change meeting at my institute. It is terrifying how the real facts of climate change, especially in my country, are not discussed at all. I'm very proud of Australia because of its carbon tax, to tell you the truth. Although I'm not so proud of the fact that you don't tax the carbon that you sell to China so they can burn. Okay, uh, all uh, right. You know, oh, yeah. well, this is a good time to bring Greg Hunter back. <clears throat> hey, look, uh, for me, for us, uh, there's an acceptance of the science. There's also a recognition that science is always evolving. There's a new assessment report being done. Uh, models are be, uh, being redone. I won't predict what outcomes that will have, but the general view w uh, is likely to be a reaffirmation, plus or minus some, uh, some elements of the basic view. The real debate here is about the right policy response. Uh, what is actually going to reduce emissions? And, our debate in Australia, and, and this is where I would absolutely disagree, Lawrence, uh, is about the fact that our emissions go up, not down, under the carbon tax. You are ultimately a rational person. Electricity is an essential, essential service. Therefore, it's barely affected in its demand by price rises. What, what does that mean? It means that we go from 560 million tonnes of emissions in Australia in 2010 to 637 million tonnes. So the big thing about the carbon tax is it doesn't actually reduce emissions. Our emissions go up, not down. And so for everybody who's concerned about climate change, the first thing you'd say is, heck, actually, it doesn't do the job. OK, all then, right. No, 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 then, no, then it affects families. On that score, I have to bring oh, in uh, Tanya Blibersey. I need to respond to a number of those assertions. Um, um, actually, we've seen uh, already uh, emissions coming down from electricity, 8.6% since carbon pricing was introduced. That's a very important success. Um, you've also got a... Greg's saying, oh, there's not really much debate in Australia about the science. His leader described himself first as a weather vane on climate change and then he said it was bullshit. And this is the man who wants to be Prime Actually, Minister. So, so you, you t take that with a grain of caution. And then Greg says, well, the real debate is how we deal with it. 
Yeah, um, we, we are dealing with it by putting a price on carbon pollution because mostly people respond when you make something more expensive, they use less of it and we want the big polluters to pollute less, to innovate. Um, Greg's proposal is that he should use taxpayers' money to give to large companies on the off chance that they might reduce their emissions sometimes, sometime in the future. So we use the money from the big polluters to change the way that, um, that people use electricity uh, and we have the uh, opposition that say we use taxpayers' money to pay it to the big polluters in the hope that something will change in the future. I think That's I better the essential respond difference. Briefly, it, br that. briefly, because there is a question so for the, you coming up. Okay, uh, so. The answer is very simple, that the government system is an electricity tax and it's a gas tax, and that means it's on families and small businesses. For the most part, nine the big ten, companies... For nine the out most of ten part, families have the big, received The assistance. big companies don't actually pay it. They pass the cost through. It's only those Australian firms which are export, uh, export exposed, which aren't able to, uh, to pass it through, which is why today we've seen one of our great Australian firms, Amcor, talk about the loss of 300 jobs because in part due to the, uh, the impact of electricity prices. So in places like the Prime Minister's own electorate, jobs were lost today. In places like Did Peter, Dick, uh, Peter Dutton's electorate of Dixon, Jobs with Amcor were lost today. Greg, a high you, dollar and then electricity. Okay, price. all right, quick, the, quick response. The, and the jobs go to China. There is a question for you. The, the jobs the, go to China the, and the car, emissions go to China. Carbon pricing has had a, a fraction, a fraction of the impact on Australian businesses that the Australian dollar has had. And it, it is so tough for Australian businesses with the strong Australian dollar. Uh, uh, the, the bad news is that is a vote of confidence for the, from the rest of the world in our economy, that strong Australian dollar. Wouldn't that dollar. make it the worst possible time? OK, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to interrupt this byplay because I've got another question from yeah. William Fiedler and it's actually for you, Greg Hunt. If successful in the next election, the Coalition has, stated, uh, has a stated commitment to a three-year direct action plan to reduce carbon emissions. Will the Coalition rule out ever moving to some form of emission trading scheme? Uh, yes, I don't see it's ever likely to happen. I don't see uh, that this is what's happening broadly. I think that when you look around the world, there are radically different approaches. And uh, when you look at the United States, I know that uh, the President just gave a State of the Union address. The real focus of that was the alternative systems that the United States would put in place. Canada's just, just had an election uh, where they rejected a carbon tax. China's not going any, anywhere near this. That's India's not actually, going I'm right. sorry, oh, no, I'm going to have to interrupt you there because uh, right. China is actually piloting yeah. uh, emissions trading schemes. And the red hat. And the red hat. I can guarantee you, and, and I can the, guarantee you that China will not be imposing a nationwide electricity, well, energy, you can gas guarantee tax. That, can I, don't, you? I don't suppose you can guarantee that. <laughs> no, you, no, 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 I, think no, that, I but have to the, say this. Okay. By the end of this year, a billion people will live in country, cities, provinces, states that have carbon pricing of, of one form or another. A billion people, all of Europe, New, uh, New Zealand, China. Well, it, it, let me jump in to why, why, say why to say it's that really no one important, else is doing even this. if you lose a few jobs now, that you consider doing this because you want to build in innovation. I, I want to I'm reduce sure you, Okay, emissions. but let me just finish for a second. I don't well, want to but I think Australia is China. particularly susceptible. I know when I've come here periodically mm -hmm. and I know there's been a lot of uh, issues about refugees and, and, and immigrants. Well, it, all the models of climate change suggest that in the equatorial regions of the, of the world, that's where they'll be hit the worst. And, when you, and now you're worried about refugees when two billion people don't have yeah. places to live or in fact their agricultural systems are gone, you're really gonna have to worry in Australia. Sure. Okay, uh, this, this uh, pause, this, uh, I'm gonna put you on pause. But the, I'm gonna put you on pause for a moment. As a tweet has come in from Alicia101. 13 years later, what does Hunt now have to say about his thesis, a tax to make the polluter pay? <laughs> Well, it's actually 23 years later, and I, I'm very proud of what was written then because it was about tradeway systems, and it was about the point that you've got to choose the right economic instrument for the right problem. And the problem with, as Nobel laureates have said... Which was the Kidler, polluter in the polluter here? Mm, uh, this was about tradeway, so things such as zinc, cadmium, mm. lead, where if you have a local problem, you can solve it locally. If, however, you have a problem with an inelastic good or an essential service, such as electricity, what you see is that you can drive up the price and it has very little effect. Those yeah, figures quick, you quick gave quick question were for incorrect you. because Quick question for you based on the philosophy of that no. idea that you just mm. put forward is, do you agree that um, CO2 is a pollutant? 
Well, I believe it has an impact on our atmosphere. If you call it a pollutant, if you call it uh, a source of impact, it's a source of climate change and climate change is a problem. The real point at the end of all of this is if you want to do something about CO2 and climate change, you wouldn't put in place a carbon tax because oh, give in, Europe, to big business. in Europe it hasn't done the job. In, uh, in the United States we've actually had a decrease in emissions because of the change in technology which has been a tremendously important thing. Uh, and in Australia, our emissions but go up, not down. Those are the facts. Companies don't change their technology unless you put an incentive in place for them to do it by pricing pollution. We price pollution. You don't dump your garbage in the street for free. It's not pricing free. pollution, it's increasing the cost of electricity. OK, hold on. We're almost out of time. Last question uh, is on this subject, a bit more general. It comes from Ian Parkin. <clears throat> As a Christian, I believe that my faith helps me to find meaning and purpose in my life and a sense of responsibility for the way we treat our planet. My question is, do Christians have a special responsibility to respond to human-induced climate change? John Dixon, let's start with you. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, but most Christians accept the science. Um, this is, I, th I hope, one of the themes of tonight's Q&A. It's uh, Christians get all the science Lawrence is talking about, plus all the other wonderful stuff. Uh, so it's not just that wonderful stuff or... Some of them. So, um, yes, we have a deep responsibility. I mean, there are some very deep ideas driving a Christian response to climate change. It's the science, we're, we're schooled by the scientists. And then the Christian sits there thinking, this creation is actually a creation, an intended, beautiful work of art and humanity is here to care for it. And more than that, that we are here to care for our neighbours, especially the neighbours that are going to feel the effects of climate change more than most, uh, poorer communities. So there is, uh, I would just say, a, a deeper or added dimension to the Christian care of the earth, whether that's showing itself in uh, church action is another question, but theoretically, Christianity should drive a very deep commitment. But not a special one. I, I really object to this notion that somehow, look, I applaud that you get faith and meaning in your life from, from your faith. That, that's fine. I, I, I get faith, I get meaning in my life from my lack of faith, okay? <laughs> uh, I mean, the fact that I, I see the, the meaning in my life is the meaning I make. And the meaning for all of us, we're so lucky to be here on this planet at this, and have brains and be able to to understand the universe back to the earliest moments of the Big Bang and be able to uh, impact on our future. And we should use those brains and, and whether or not, and we shouldn't rely on someone else guiding us. What I'm but, saying but, is, but I get on. all of that. But, I get but, all no, of that. But hold Plus on. Jesus. But, but, yeah, but, you know, but, but, that, but the point is, that's fine. But the point is, that doesn't give you any special. We are all humans. So you, you may get your meaning from your life from Christianity, but to argue that, you have, but I get to argue that you have somehow an addition <laughs> that gives okay. you more meaning in your life and more reason to take care of the earth is crazy. We all have the responsibility to take care of the earth, whether we're Christians or not. Um, I, I wanted to hear from all the panel, but I'm... We've actually gone well over time, so uh, we'll have to leave it there. That's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, John Dixon, Lawrence Klaus, Tanya Plibersek, Greg Hunt and Cindy Pan. Next week, next week on Q&A, we'll uh, turn our attention back to our own small corner of the universe with the US Ambassador to Australia, Jeff Blush, Australia's Foreign Minister, Bob Carr, the Shadow Minister for Communications, Malcolm Turnbull, Egyptian novelist, commentator and activist, Adaf Suif, and uh, author, feminist and social commentator, Eva Cox. Until next week's Q&A, good night.